This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Cosmos. Would you like to see it? The ancient gnome asks. My opus, why I came here? You nod, and he leads you down the hallway. Outside the windows, you can see the strange landscape of Mechanus, the clockwork nirvana. The city below the gnome's tower is laid out in perfect concentric circles on a circular plane of grayish something. Stone? Metal? In the sky, at precise angles, all interlocked, massive gears and cogs of the same substance turn. You know this cog, the one you're on, is also turning, but you can't feel it. Your reverie is cut short as the gnome unlocks a door at the end of the hall and ushers you into a massive domed space. A great contraption fills it. Spheres mounted on arms and concentric rings, hundreds of them all painted and labeled. Strange mists held in place by magic connect some of the spheres. There it is, the gnome wheezes. A cosmos, everything. Inner planes, outer planes. It had to be done here. This is the only place it would all work. And still, bits would have problems. See, Limbo there. It won't stay mounted right. It's off. That's Limbo, I guess. In the beginning, there was nothing. We don't mean that there was the empty space of void. We mean there was nothing. There wasn't even space, so there was nowhere for anything to exist in. And then, very suddenly, there was something. We're not sure how. It might have been just a mathematical rounding error. It was well within acceptable tolerances, though because the universe has an inherent inaccuracy built into it. A very tiny inaccuracy. But it was enough to create a single infinitesimal point of raw energy. There was so much energy that it forced space and time to expand outward, and the energy filled the space. But as it all expanded, it got spread out and cooled down. The energy, as it cooled, started to turn into different stuff, different particles, different types of energy. And meanwhile, space kept on expanding until it was mostly empty. And the stuff condensed into clouds and gravity took over. The clouds became stars. New elements were forged in the heart of the stars. The stars exploded. The new elements got caught around other stars or condensed into new clouds. And on at least one lump of silicon and iron and carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen and oxygen, weird chemicals started to mix together. And the chemicals had strange properties they could copy themselves, and they could make other chemicals react, and they could clump together to get stuff done. Various chemical combinations turned out to be really good at this, and they copied themselves more and more and clumped together and teamed up more and more, and whenever a new thing appeared that was particularly good at doing stuff and copying itself, it spread. And eventually, people happen. We might think of that whole thing as our modern creation myth, our story of how the universe formed. And some of you might take umbrage with the word myth, but it's fairer than you think. After all, myth comes from the Greek word mythos, meaning a true story, and it is related to the Greek word meo, which means to teach or indoctrinate. Moreover, the fact is that there's a lot still unexplained, and a lot that has been discovered to be inaccurate, a lot that has had to be refined. Which is, of course, how science works. In that respect, 
were no different from the ancient Babylonians, who knew they lived in a land between two rivers and had to figure out where those rivers came from and why there was land. And their story was about a void filled with nothing that one day started to divide itself into elementary forces, and those forces interacted in such a way as to create a universe. But the word of the week is cosmos. Today, we think of the cosmos as basically a big empty space. Maybe it's infinite, maybe it's not. There's little seas of stuff floating in there, stars, planets, moons, nebula, black holes, and so on. And we live on one particular lump of rock floating nowhere in particular. If we're more savvy and scientifically minded, we think of the cosmos as a bunch of stuff drawn on the outside of a balloon that someone keeps inflating. All the little dots on the balloon are getting further and further away from each other as the balloon gets bigger and bigger and space and time become more stretched out. But the cosmos is even more complicated than that. It's filled with whole bunches of invisible stuff. Dark matter that we can't locate or identify or explain causes strange gravitational tides. Dark energy seems to drive the universe to expand faster and faster. We don't know why. More bizarrely, it turns out our universe may not be the only one out there. I don't mean alternate dimensions or anything crazy like that. It's just that the balloon of the universe might not have blown up evenly. It might be covered in blisters and pimples all expanding on their own. It might be like a raspberry. Tiny little universes all expanding off it at different rates. Maybe even with different physical laws. And that's the thing. That's why our word isn't universe or the more pedantic multiverse. It's cosmos, and we think of cosmos as a synonym for universe, but it really isn't. Because, for example, our universe might just be one blister universe on a weird hyperdimensional super universe. And even multiverse doesn't quite capture the right feel. Cosmos comes from the Greek, and the word cosmos doesn't mean universe, it means a system of order. In fact, it comes from the same Greek root as the verb kosmin, which means to prepare, to arrange, to establish, or even to adorn. Cosmos is actually the opposite of chaos. And when we say cosmos, we don't just mean the universe, we mean the whole arrangement of absolutely everything and how it all fits together. It's a really beautiful word. Speaking of worlds or universes or cosmoses which are way more complicated than the people living on them might appreciate. Let's talk about the D&D cosmos. We've talked about D&D worlds like Orth and Ebertoral and Athos. We might think of those as planets, if we want to be boring about it. Until Forgotten Realms broached the topic of alternate worlds, we accepted that each of these worlds was its own thing, each was the center of its own self-contained cosmos. But even then, things were kind of complicated, because there were questions that needed answering. Questions like, where do the gods live? And where do the dead go? And just where is a wizard going when they cast teleport, or dimension door, or whatever? Or, for that matter, where do elementals come from? In the earliest versions of D&D, various other worlds were mentioned. But in July of 1977, a year before the publication of the original Advanced Dungeons & Dragons First Edition Player's Handbook, Gary Gygax took a stab at explaining the cosmos of D&D. In Dragon Magazine, Volume 1, Number 8, an article appeared called, get ready for this, Planes, the Concepts of Spatial, Temporal, and Physical Relationships in D&D. 
In D&D, a plane, short for plane of existence, is a self-contained little bubble of reality. They can be huge or tiny, they can even be infinite, and they all exist side by side. But you can only travel between planes in some very precise and magical ways. Gygax's original plan divided the cosmos into two layers, the inner planes and the outer planes. At the center, the innermost of the inner planes was the prime material plane, reality as we know it, Orth, Toral, Athos, whatever. Along with the sun and moon and stars and whatever. Surrounding it, in a sea called the ethereal plane, there existed the elemental planes, which were the planes of raw elements. Surrounding those in a different sea called the astral plane were the outer planes. These were the mythical realms of the gods and of concepts and ideas. They were actually based on alignment of all things. You had lawful good planes and chaotic neutral planes and neutral evil planes. This basic model became entrenched in D&D, like completely entrenched. It was refined numerous times, but the model remained essentially the same. It was republished and clarified and clarified some more. In AD&D 2nd Edition, the definitive work on the planes of existence appeared. Well, sort of definitive. Because if you remember from our episode on the Malabranche, they wouldn't mention demons and devils and heaven and hell, even though most of the outer planes were connected to real-world mythologies and religions. From the beginning, you had heaven, hell, limbo, nirvana, Hades, and so on. But the Planescape campaign setting, apart from changing some of the names, was basically the last resource on the planes. Everything that came after it followed the same formula. Except 4th edition. We'll come back to that. How did it work? Like this. At the center, you had the prime material plane. That was made up of crystalline spheres floating in a fiery space called Phlogiston. Each crystalline sphere had a world in it. Orth, Toral, Athos, etc. Using the rules for D&D in space, called Spelljammer, you could sail the Phlogiston in magical ships and travel to the worlds of your favorite campaign settings or any other world. The ethereal plane connected the prime material plane with the inner planes. These included the planes of fire, water, earth, and air, and also positive and negative energy. And the planes rubbed up against each other. They created quasi-elemental planes and para-elemental planes. Fire and earth made magma. Earth and water made ooze. You had ice and smoke, radiance, mineral, steam, lightning, dust, vacuum, salt, and ash. From the astral plane, you could reach the outer planes, and they were arranged in a big disk called the Great Wheel. Starting from the lawfulest and goodest plane of the seven mounting heavens of Celestia, you have the twin paradises of Bitopia, the blessed fields of Elysium, the happy hunting grounds of the Beastlands, the Olympian glades of Arborea, the heroic domains of Isgard, the ever-changing chaos of Limbo, the windswept depths of Pandemonium, the infinite layers of the Abyss, which formerly had 666 layers, the Tartarian depths of Karkarai, the grey wastes of Hades, the bleak eternity of Gehana, also called the fourfold fires of perdition, the nine hells of Beator, the infernal battlefield of Archeron, the clockwork nirvana of Mechanus, and the peaceable kingdoms of Arcadia. As you proceed around the circle, the alignment changes. Lawful good at the heavens moving to neutral and chaotic good, then chaotic neutral and evil, then neutral evil and lawful evil, up to lawful neutral, and back around to lawful good. And in the middle of it all, the plane of true neutrality is the concordant opposition of the Outlands. Now, 
we're using the names from the third edition Manual of the Plains as the definitive names because they mashed together all of the names a plane has ever had. What was Nirvana became Mechanus and is now the clockwork Nirvana of Mechanus. The Seven Heavens became Celestia and now it's the Seven Mounting Heavens. Weirdly, Olympus became Arborea before becoming the Olympian Glades of Arborea. And that's because the elf gods lived in a domain at the base of Mount Olympus in deep forested valleys. Now, it's a really cool cosmology. But there's a lot that just doesn't get used. And there's a lot of bloat. Do we really need 18 elemental planes considering they are so deadly most people can't ever go there? Did anyone ever adventure in the twin paradises of Bytopia? It was the plane of gnomes and boredom. And what even is a happy hunting ground? The designers of 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons decided not to waste the space. They economized the hell out of things. They figured if you couldn't use it in a game, it wasn't worth wasting pages on. So all of the elemental planes together got mashed into one churning mass. The elemental chaos. The Great Wheel got broken up. The best planes were retained and set floating in a magical sea called the Astral Sea, which was part astral plane and part phlogiston. There were maybe a dozen of them. The Nine Hells, of course, Mount Celestia, the bright city of Hestivar, Tytherion, the plane of endless night, and they had a few new cool concepts, like the fairy plane of the Feywild, and the realm of the dead, the Shadowfell. People hated it. The Great Wheel cosmology was so much a part of the identity of D&D &D that getting rid of it, even though the vast vast majority of players didn't use it, and few could even list all of the planes, was impossible. And so, the designers brought it back for 5th edition. Mostly. There were a few economizations that survived. All of the para-elemental and quasi-elemental planes were gone. The elemental chaos remains. The crystal spheres are gone. But the Shadowfell and the Feywild have been added as coexistent dimensions to the prime material world. But the biggest difference between the Great Wheel cosmology and the 4th edition cosmology isn't in what planes exist. It's what's missing from the Great Wheel. The reason our cosmos is the way it is is because of how it started. We can't explain everything about dark matter and dark energy and blister universes and why the universe is a seething foam of imaginary energy or anything like that. But we do understand that why it exists and how it exists are inextricably tied together. And the fourth edition cosmology had a creation myth about primordials and gods and the creation of the natural world and the Feywild and the Shadowfell and the Great Wheel? It just sort of is. It's just a setting. It's just a cosmos. And that ties into how you can use all of this in your game. Look, it's neat to have all these other worlds and divine realms. Piles and piles of them. That's fine. And it's even okay if some of them are places that no one can ever go to. It wasn't the bloat of the Great Wheel cosmology that was the real problem. It's that the Great Wheel cosmology didn't tell a story. Heroes might never travel to the Elemental Chaos or the Abyss in 4th edition, but those things are tied to the backstory of the universe. They're interesting. Most spots in the Great Wheel just fill space. Bytopia existed because alignments demanded a plane between Heaven and Elysium. Now. In the Planescape setting, why everything existed the way it did was a major theme. Most PCs in Planescape belong to philosophical factions trying to understand the multiverse and to use that knowledge to gain power. But to take that and drop it in a D&D &D world that isn't about grand scientific and philosophical cosmological exploration is a bit silly. When you create your own world, 
maybe dumb down the Great Wheel. And look, we love it too. We grew up on the Great Wheel. We played Planescape. We named all of those planes and described the layout from memory. It's in our gamer DNA. But that doesn't mean it makes for a good game. When it came time for us to create our recent new D&D campaign, our cosmology was a lot different. It was sort of a take on the 4th edition cosmology. A flat world. The elemental chaos below explodes up into the world and creates new matter. The astral sea above, with the floating domains of the gods, is the source of light and life and heavenly bodies. Far below, the abyss, where everything is destroyed. And we adapted the 4th edition creation myth to explain why it was the way it was. Our universe might be infinite, but in a fictional universe, smaller is better. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.